The nucleus of a particular element decays, emitting a series of alpha and beta particles. Which of the following series of emissions will result in an isotope of the original element? So an isotope means the same proton number. Alpha decreases proton number by two. Beta minus increases proton number by one. So we can go through each of the options and see what effect they would have. So option A would decrease proton number by one. Option B, proton number stays the same. Option C is decreased by three. And option four or D is decreased by two. So you can see the correct answer is going to be B. So which equation shows the process of annihilation? So annihilation is a particle and it's antiparticle producing two photons. Uh, so A, um, the antiparticle of A pi minus is pi plus. So that's not it. And it's not producing two photons. Um, B, we've got a particle, a proton and an antiproton making two photons. So that works. C, a proton and an electron are not antiparticles. And D, I don't even know what that is. It's some form of pair production and we're losing a photon somehow. So it's not that one. OK, so which one of the following is not made of quarks? So a kaon is a, made of a quark and antiquark, so it's not that. A muon is a type of lepton because it's a big electron, so that is not made of quarks. A neutron is made of three quarks. A pion is a quark and antiquark, so it would be clearly option B. What is the quark structure of an antiproton? Uh, an up, an anti-up, anti-down uh, doesn't have enough quarks. Uh, a proton is a baryon or an anti-baryon, so it should have three anti-quarks. Uh, antiprotons don't have any strange quarks. It should be anti-up, anti-up, anti-down. That's an anti-neutron. So the one we're looking for is option D. OK, so the equation represents the weak interaction between a negative pion and a proton. What is the charge barrier number and strangeness of particle X? So on the left hand side, we've got a pi minus and a proton. So we've got a total charge of zero. A kaon is neutral, so the particle we're producing must be neutral as well. So we can get rid of C. On the left hand side, we've got a pion and a baryon. So we've got a baryon number of one. At the moment, on the right hand side, we've got a baryon number of zero. So we're going to need to produce a baryon so we can eliminate option A. And unfortunately, we can't eliminate either of the last two options, which is why this question was removed when this was actually done as exam, because you can't actually, it could either be B or D. It doesn't matter. OK, so the diagram gives some energy levels of a hydrogen atom. The transition of an excited hydrogen atom from E3 to E1 is visible light. Which transition would cause ultraviolet light? So we're looking for a bigger energy transition because ultraviolet has higher photon energy than visible. Uh, E4 to E3 is really small. E3 to E2 is clearly smaller than E3 to E1. Likewise, E2 to 1 has got to be smaller than E3 to 1. So we know it must be E1 to E0, which it does indeed look bigger. Um, and it's bigger as well if we look at the values as well. OK, so a proton moving with speed v has a de Broglie wavelength lambda. What is the de Broglie wavelength for an alpha particle moving at the same speed? So proton mass, I'm going to say, is m. So then alpha mass would be 4m because it's two protons and two neutrons. So the wavelength of the proton would be h over mv. The wavelength of alpha would be h over 4mv, which is a quarter of the original. And so that's going to be a. What is the phase difference between two points 0.16 metres apart on a progressive wave and its sound wave of frequency 256? Now we've got the speed of sound is 330. So the first thing we can do is figure out what the wavelength of the sound wave is using the speed and frequency. And then phase difference is the ratio of the distance between the points as a fraction of the wavelength times 2 pi, which you can see comes out about pi over 4, uh, which is option C. The frequency of the first harmonic of a standing wave is f. The length of wire and the tension are both doubled. What is the frequency of the first harmonic as a result? So I'm going to express the new frequency as divided by the old frequency. So we've doubled the length and we've doubled the tension. You can see uh, lots of this stuff is just going to cancel out and you get left with root 2 over 2. 
So the new frequency is the old frequency divided by root 2, which is option A. OK, so in a diffraction grating experiment, the maxima are produced on a screen. What causes the separation of the maxima of a diffraction pattern to decrease? So a longer wavelength has a larger angle of diffraction. Uh, the increase in the distance between the screen and the grating, uh, if you have a fixed angle that's, and you make the distance bigger, that's also going to make them spread wider on the screen. Increasing the distance between the source and the grating is not going to have any effect at all. Um, but So that kind of leaves us with this one, and that works uh, using a greater separation that does bring the fringes together. And you can see this one by using the diffraction grating equation n lambda is d sine theta to answer most of this. White light is passed through a single narrow slit and illuminates the screen. What is observed on the screen? A set of equally spaced white fringes. Note the outer fringes are not white. A central maximum made of a spectrum surrounded by white fringes. Note the outer fringes are not white and the central one is not the spectrum. Uh, a central white maximum surrounded by coloured fringes. Yep, that's the one we're looking for. A single narrow white line. No, that, uh, that would indicate no interference has happened. Which of the following is correct when total internal reflection occurs? Angle of instance is greater than the critical angle, so that's not right. It goes from high optical density to low. That is correct. That works. Uh, no, it, it goes from high to low, so C is wrong. Uh, and with total internal refraction, there is no refraction, so that's not right either. What is the speed of light in glass of refractive index 1.42? Uh, so refractive index is the speed of light in a vacuum of the speed of light in a substance. Plug the numbers in and we can see the answer is B, which is a scalar quantity. Uh, momentum is a vector. It's a scalar times a vector, which is a vector. Weight is a force, which is a vector. Power is uh, energy per second. Energy and time are both scalars, so that's clearly going to be a scalar quantity. And moment is a vector quantity, because it has magnitude and direction. Clockwise and clockwise. OK, so the velocity time graph for a falling object is shown. Which is the right acceleration time graph? Well, the gradient of the velocity time graph is clearly decreasing to zero, so the acceleration should be decreasing to zero. That's clearly graph B. A girl starts her jog at 2 metres per second in a straight line for 30 seconds, turns around and returns to her starting point 20 seconds later. What is her average velocity and average speed? Well, if she's come back to the same place, her displacement is zero. So her average velocity has to be zero. So we can eliminate C and D straight away. Then we need to do a little bit of calculation. We can calculate how far she ran before she turned around. Then we can calculate what her uh, speed was when she was running back. And the way I approach this is, well, she's running at two meters per second for 30 seconds and three meters per second for only 20. So she must be below the midpoint, making it option A. <laughs> A golf ball was hit from the surface of the moon. Flight time is four seconds. What's the best estimate for the maximum height reached with the acceleration of 1.6 meters per second squared? Well, the first thing I realized was at maximum height, the time would have taken two seconds. The time to maximum height is going to be half the whole flight time if you're hit from the surface. Then using the Suva equation that um, often gets overlooked, at maximum height, find the vertical velocity is zero. So then we can just plug the values in and get 3.2, which is around option A. Okay, so a deep space probe travelling forward at constant speed is briefly acted on by a force at right angles to its motion. What is the effect of this force on the forward speed and the sideways speed? Well, if it's at right angles to the forward direction, it's acting sideways. So any answer that says the forward speed changes is wrong. So we can get rid of those all straight away. So we know it's option C, because if it's at 90 degrees, it can have no effect on the forward speed. OK, so the mass of fuel in a racing car decreases during the race. And as a result, the lap time decreases. 
Which of the following could explain this decrease? Uh, there's less friction on the racetrack. Uh, no, for a race car, friction is a good thing. You need friction to help you accelerate, to help you brake, and helps to help you turn corners. So uh, that would not be a good thing. Maximum speed would be unaffected because maximum speed is limited by air resistance. Air resistance is limited by your surface area. That hasn't changed. Uh, maximum acceleration and deceleration are greater. Uh, that would be true. If you have a smaller mass, your acceleration will be bigger if you have the same force. Uh, so that works. The engine is more efficient. Oh, I don't see any reason why it would be. Okay, so what is represented by the area under a force displacement graph? Uh, work done. That's just something you should know. Which of the following is not a unit of power? So I can eliminate C straight away because the watt is a unit of power. And then we're just breaking things down into base units. So a watt is a joule per second. A joule is a newton meter, and a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So you can see all of those. So we've seen A, we've seen D, and joule seconds is not quite a unit of power. Joules S to the minus one would be. A roller coaster car is raised to a height of 65 meters and released. What is the maximum possible speed? The maximum speed will be if all of its GP is turned into kinetic energy. And uh, we can plug the values in and we get 36. That's the answer. In a test, a 500 kilogram car is traveling at 10 meters per second and it hits a wall. The front 0.30 meters of the car crumples as the car is brought to rest. What is the average force? So first thing I did work out how much kinetic energy the object has. And if it's brought to a stop, we must have done work equal to that. That's how we uh, bring it to rest. We've done that over a distance of 0.3 meters, so that gives us this force, which is D. The current in a wire is 20 milliamps. How many electrons pass a point in the wire in two minutes? So first of all, we can work out the charge that's passed through using Q equals IT. One electron has the charge of 1.6 times 10 to minus 19, and we can figure out the number of electrons is the option B. A resistor and a diode are connected in series with a variable power supply, as shown in the diagram, which best shows the characteristic for the combination of a resistor and a diode. So we know a diode doesn't allow a current to flow until you reach a certain potential difference. And that wouldn't change just because you were a resistor in series with it. So we're going to have option A is going to look like a diode circuit to start off with. But once the diode's activated, it's going to look kind of like a normal ohmic conductor circuit. A cell of negligible resistance and a switch are in series with the resistor. The switch is moved to the on or closed position at for a time t, which change results reduces sorry the amount of charge flowing through the resistance in time t. Uh, putting a cell in parallel with c. Uh, no, that has no effect if we're ignoring the resistance of the cell. Adding a cell in series would increase the number of charges, not decrease. Adding a resistor would decrease the current and therefore would decrease the number of charge. Adding a resistor in parallel would make no difference to the charge going through R. The national grid uses high voltage transmission lines to carry electrical power around the UK. A particular transmission line delivers 800 megawatts of power at 132 kV to the user. It loses 1% of the transmitted power as heat. What is the resistance of the transmission line? So the first thing I did is work out what the current in the transition line using the power and the voltage. And then once you've got the current, you can use P equals I squared R to figure out what the resistance is which is option A. The thing you need to avoid with this question is trying to use um, something like P equals V squared over R, because you need to remember in V squared over R, V stands for the potential difference across the component, which we don't know. We don't know what the potential difference between the start and the end of the power line is, uh, which is why we can't use that method. A potential divider circuit consists of a battery connected across a thermistor and a variable resistor in series. 
in which of the following causes the potential difference across the thermistor to increase. Increasing the temperature, note that would drop the resistance and therefore drop the voltmeter reading. Increasing the resistance of the variable resistor, that would increase the potential difference across the resistor and therefore decrease it across the thermistor. Reducing the EMF of the battery is clearly going to make it go down because uh, you've got a smaller amount to share. So we must be left with option D, which makes sense because that decreases the resistance of the uh, the variable resistor part of the circuit. So then you get a higher potential difference across the thermistor. A student investigates how the potential difference across the terminals of a cell varies with current which shows the graph. So if you've done the experiment, you should recognize straight away uh, we want A, because the higher the current is, the bigger the potential drop is across the internal resistance. And then finally, a battery connected to a 10 ohm resistor and a switch in series. A voltmeter is connected across the battery. When the resistor is open, off, the voltmeter reads 1.45, that's the EMF. When the switch is closed, the reading is 1.26, which is the terminal voltage. What's the internal resistance of the battery? Well, the first thing I would do is figure out what the current is when the switch is closed. So we do the terminal voltage divided by the external resistance, giving us 0.126 amps. Then we can put that into our EMF equation and figure out the resistance is 1.5 ohms, which concludes this video and the 2016 paper.